Okay, well, I have a uh, I have 10 SLT. Um should we wait for any late stragglers or we should go ahead and get started? Yeah, um so there's a note card giver. Well, I'll I'll I'll, I'll explain this if, uh, when we get started. Um Okay. All right, let's go ahead and get started then. Uh, lights, camera, action. Uh, well, uh, welcome uh, everyone to uh, our uh, m latest in a, the series of Science Circle panel discussions. Um, we're going to have a, a little bit of an experimental format uh, today, um, as you can see, we have kind of a de minimis panel. <laughs> uh, it's myself and Delia, who has graciously uh, uh, accepted to um, uh, share uh, her uh, thoughts uh, on this topic. So we appreciate that. Um, the so the topic today is uh, basically animals. Um, which I think are pretty cool. Um, I, but I'm not just going to be showing, um, cute Facebook animal videos. We're going to be looking at scientific, uh, uh reports of so the scientific study of animal behavior. Um, and, uh, so, so, uh, key to this, I think, whole, experiment here is going to be synchronized video viewing. So um, I have resed here a special screen, the Peril Vision screen, um, which has a cool feature that allows everyone in the parcel to all be watching the video from the same point. So it sync synchronizes the video. So what's going to happen is I'm going to load a link to the screen. Also, by the way, uh, I'll interrupt myself here. The um, Science Circle box next to Delia is a note card giver, and one of the note cards is a screen help. So if you have, so make sure that you have your video enabled in your preferences. Allow it to autoplay. Um, allow it to um, let uh, scripts play uh, video and uh, disable the video filtering, the media filtering. Um, so uh, the way the syncing works is I'm going to load the video and um, you uh, some text will appear on the screen and you want to click on the text portion of the screen. Let's click on the text. Then if you need to synchronize, if you feel like you're out of sync, if you'll notice on the left side of the screen is a little extended panel with two buttons and the lower button has a recycle symbol. So just click that recycle symbol and then you will be synchronized with everyone else in the room. Okay, so we're gonna try this. Um, uh, so I do have a few introductory remarks I'd like to make. One of the things that inspired me to do this talk is my fandom, my boy crush on Franz de Waals. Um, and I'm interested in a couple of points that he makes, which I think is interesting. So one is that morality is evolved. The human morality is evolved. So, um, and what the deal with that is that there are sort of two schools of thought about human morality. One is from the philosopher Kant, who postulated that morality is obtained through intellectual reason, that we use our intellect to reason about morality, and then sort of we come up with moral rules that way, and then we impose that reason to morality on society. The other school of thought comes from the philosopher Hume, um, who sort of felt that morality is sort of just a natural byproduct of living socially. 
that when you live socially, you just kind of inherently develop a set of norms and understandings about how you're going to behave. It's an evolved morality. And one of the things that Franz de Waals looks at is to see whether we can find evidence of an evolved morality in the animal kingdom. So, um, uh, 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 let me see if I can pull up this link. So one of the first things uh, I want to show is um, the, see if I can select this link, um, uh, is uh, one of his discussions about um, morality in the animal kingdom. Um, I think another, uh, frankly, another one of his motivations in trying to demonstrate that morality is evolved rather than obtained through reason um, is, in fact, to separate morality from religion. Um, because I think the Kantian view is basically a religious view um, that, re that morals are imposed on us from some authority. Um, and I think he wants to attach morality to that idea. So hopefully, so let's, let's try our little experiment here. I'm gonna go ahead and load this video and we can watch it. Oh, wait, actually, hang on, I forgot. So my other point uh, that I wanted to sort of highlight in this presentation um, is Vanderwall's other tenant, which is uh, he's kind of resisting the notion that um, it is wrong to anthropomorphize animal behavior. Um, and again, there are two schools of thought, mainly coming from philosophers, again, which say that humans are just categorically distinct from animals um, and that you cannot ascribe to animals uh, human motivations or that. But the other school of thought, which really is actually, I think, more prevalent with biologists, um, and scientists, which is that you simply have to recognize the biological evolutionary history of humanity and that humans, you know, emerged from the same nature that all these other animals live in and that therefore it's not unreasonable to believe that, um, that some of the higher animals, chimpanzees and um, uh, other creatures, maybe dolphins even, and so forth, you know, have emotions and are able to exhibit very interesting sort of humanistic behaviors like reciprocity and compassion um, and cooperation and things like that, which, um, you know, we can completely relate to. Um, and I sort of endorse that view. I think it is, um, I think it's, it, I disagree with the view that, um, that animals are categorically different. Okay, with that said, uh, let's try our first video. This is Franz de Waals. So click on the text, and then the video should start. And if you're out of sync, you can click that recycle button.
Uh, I believe one of the things that um, made Van der Waals famous is he's kind of famous for coining the term alpha male in his book about alpha males in chimp societies. Look how similar the bonobo lovemaking is to humans. Isn't that interesting? I think that's remarkable. So, um, to demonstrate reciprocity, uh, he's going to show us some really interesting, like, archival footage. Uh, one of the things he's going to show us is uh, this, eight, this chimpanzee experiment from 1937. Uh, this is amazing to me. That. And now so the persistence in the hungry the chimpanzee to, um, so you know, to nudge the, the companion to cooperate with him is, I think, quite striking. You know, he knows that he needs the cooperation of the other chimpanzee. Now look at what happens at the very end of this. Um, if you're having trouble with the video, there, uh, there's a note card giver in the box next to Delia that has a note card for screen help. So, so there are two interesting parts about this. One is that the chimp on the right has a full understanding he needs the partner, so full understanding of the need for cooperation. The second one is that the partner is willing to work even though he's not interested in the food. Why would that be? Well, that probably has to do with reciprocity. There's actually a lot of evidence in, in primates and other animals. <laughs> I like that, that comment that you just can't so make an apparatus that a single elephant can't pull. And so that's how this all <laughs> operates. We do the same task with elephants. Now, with elephants, it's very dangerous to work with elephants. And another problem with elephants is that you cannot make an apparatus that is too heavy. Uh, this experimental design is quite ingenious, I think. You can probably make it, but it's going to be a, a pretty clumsy apparatus, I think.
And so what we did in their case, it is we do these studies in Thailand with Josh Plotnick, is we have an apparatus around of which there's a rope, a single rope. And if you pull on this side of the rope, the rope disappears on the other side. So two elephants need to pick it up at exactly the Never same Never underestimate point. how Otherwise animals are motivated by food, even elephants. So the first tape you're going to see is two elephants who are released together, arrive at the apparatus. The apparatus is on the left with food on it. And so they come together, they arrive together, they pick it up together, and they pull together. So it's, it's actually fairly simple for them. There they are. And so th that's how they bring it in. But now we're going to make it more difficult because the, the whole purpose of this experiment is to see how... Yeah, look, well he knows that he can't pull the rope by himself. As the I love that. And so what we do in the next step is we release one elephant before the other, and that elephant needs to be smart. But if he just stands on the rope, see, totally um, then the rope when the other elephant pulls on it, over. his but end of the rope won't disappear, it won't slip away, it. so all he has to but do is stand on it. the understanding that he has because he puts his big foot on the rope. And he just, like, innately figured that out somehow. The other, and then the other is going to do all the work for him. So, so it's, I'm not it's sure I would have thought of that. But, but it shows uh, the intelligence that the elephants had. They, they developed several of these alternative techniques that we did not approve of necessarily. So the other elephant is now coming. <laughs> and the other elephant has to work really hard to pull the food in. <laughs> I look at the other, the other doesn't forget to eat, of course. <laughs> this was the cooperation reciprocity part. Now something on empathy. Empathy is my main topic at the moment of research, and empathy has sort of two qualities. One is the understanding part of it. This is just a regular definition, the ability to understand and share the feelings of another, and the emotional part. And so empathy has basically two channels. One is the body channel. If you talk with a sad person, you're going to adopt a um, sad Yeah, I think uh, a sad uh, anonymous sad entities comment sad. about sort of the mural, body mirror neurons, of um, empathy, I think is which many apt. animals have. Your average dog has that also. That's actually why people keep mammals in the home and not turtles or snakes or something like that, who don't have that kind of empathy. And then there's a cognitive channel, which is more that you can take the perspective of somebody else. So he's going to show a clip of a chimpanzee looking at an animation of a, a chimpanzee yawning and then infectiously yawning himself. It's a very old one in the animal kingdom. And in humans, of course, we can study that with yawn contagion. Humans yawn. And the animated head is really crappy. It's not even realistic, but it still works. Also, we know that people See, it's not, it's not even that good. People who have problems with empathy, such as autistic children, they don't have yawn contagion. So it is connected. And we study that in our chimpanzees by presenting them with an animated head. So that's what you see on the upper left, an animated head that yawns. And there's a chimpanzee watching, an actual real chimpanzee watching a computer screen on which we play these animations. See, on the right there, the, other, the, the real chimpanzee is yawning, prompted by the animated video. And so yawn contagion that you're probably all familiar with, and maybe you're going to start yawning soon now, uh, is, is something that we share with other animals, and that's related to that whole body channel of synchronization that underlies empathy. And that is but here you can kind of see how even in animal societies, um, this kind of morality beginning to emerge of comforting people and and cooperating together and things like that. Um, you know, these are, I think, really like foundational components of human morality. It's empathy driven. Uh, that's actually the way they study empathy in human children is to instruct a family member to act distressed and then they see what young children do. And so uh, it is related to empathy and that's the kind of expressions we look at. We also recently published an experiment, <laughs> you may have heard about it, on, on altruism in chimpanzees. Uh, where the question is, do chimpanzees care about the welfare of somebody else? And, and for, for decades, um, it had been a so. What we're looking at with Van der Waals is testing animals in a laboratory setting. Um, 
Later, uh, we'll look at what it's like to study, for example, dolphins in a wild setting. Like, how do you test wild animals in their natural habitat? And one has a bucket full of tokens, and the tokens have different meanings. One kind of token feeds only the partner who chooses, the other one feeds both of them. So this, this is a study we did with Vicky Horner. And here you have the two color tokens. So they have a whole bucket full of them. Uh, and they have to uh, yes, one, Vic one makes an excellent calls. point that in chimpanzee so society, the alpha male's role actually is comforter in chief. Um, unlike our present uh, alpha male uh, in the White House, um, and in con stark contrast to our previous alpha male in the White House, um, it is important that the alpha, um, you know, getting comforted by the alpha is very powerful in these societies, and that's an important function that they have. It doesn't really matter. So she gives us now a pro-social token, and both chimps get fed. So the one who makes the choices always get a reward. So it doesn't matter whatsoever, and she should actually be, be choosing blindly. But what we find is that they prefer the pro-social token. So this is the 50% line, that's the random expectation. And especially if the partner draws attention to itself, they, they choose more. And if the partner puts pressure on them, so I if think, the partner uh, starts spitting water uh, and intimidating them, I think them, a game the theory like uh, the prisoner's have. dilemma it, it's like also the supports the sort of social benefits and this is of reciprocity no over, so you know, hundreds and hundreds of iterations. Well of After a while, societies figure out the benefits group. of reciprocity. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study. Oh, yeah, this is a classic, classic video that went viral, I think, uh, last year. Very well known. And we did that originally with that he's going to show here in a minute. I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs and with birds and with chimpanzees. Um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with Capuchin. Yeah, me too, CB. So what we did is we put two capuchins. What strikes me about this side. video is how quickly the monkey on the left gets outraged. I mean, it doesn't take three or four or five, and if you, give both you know, of them cucumbers uh, snubs the task, of the grape. The side side. Like, he gets outraged instantly. Like, like, the very first time he doesn't get a grape, really he gets outraged. Anyway. <laughs> but cucumber is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so, if you give them grapes, it's a far better food. Uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, uh, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see. Yeah, it's important that the one on the left sees that the other one got the grape. And Even though it doesn't look like he's paying attention, he still notices that the other one got the grape. And that's what she does. See? He's like outraged immediately. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. <laughs> We are the one percent. We are the ninety nine percent. So, this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. Yeah, apparently, this video, uh, this experiment generated a lot of comments from economists. Let, let me tell you, I, I still have two minutes left. Let me tell you a funny story about this. This, this study became very famous, and we got a lot of comments, especially anthropologists, economists, <laughs> uh, philosophers. They didn't like this at all because they had decided in their mind, I believe, that, um, that, that uh, uh, fairness is a very complex issue and that animals cannot have it. And so one philosopher even wrote us that it was impossible that monkeys had a sense of fairness because fairness was invented during the French Revolution. <laughs> so... 
Now, and, and oh, that's an interesting twist. I not, had not picked up on that uh, detail, but, but there are variations of this experiment where the one who got the grape refuses the grape. Who's been doing this with I hadn't noticed had that before. A couple of combinations of chimpanzees where indeed the one who would get the grape would refuse the grape until the other guy also got a grape. So we're getting very close to the human sense of fairness and I think philosophers need to rethink their philosophy for a while. So let me summarize. I feel I like uh, Franz de Waals is very compelling at assembling evidence for his argument. Which are empathy and consolation, uh, pro-social tendencies, and reciprocity and the sense of fairness. And so we work on these particular issues to see um, if we can create a morality from the bottom up, so to speak. And uh, in our in, in the um, in our note card giver, um, I have a, a note card with some other video links. Um, I have a, another uh, Franz de Waals um, link, uh, just with just an interview with him, basically. Um, where he kind of elaborates more on his um, on his ideas, so I recommend that also. Um, so, uh, two really important points here, though. That one is that most of the studies are done in laboratory settings. Yeah, makes a difference. I mean, that that just circumscribes a lot of behaviors. Um, and the second is that different groups evolve in different ways. So that in the wild with uh, chimpanzees and bonobos and uh, other primates in social groups, they have, uh, even within the species, cultural or ethnic variations. I want to uh, describe that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, uh, with that prompting, let's take a look at a, a dolphin video that shows what it's like to try to study uh, intelligent animals in their natural habitat outside of a laboratory. And how, how do you try to construct um, a, uh, a, a, you know, uh, a, a way to interact with them? So let's check this out. Uh, hopefully this will work. And again, um, be sure to click on the text uh, when I load the video. And then if you're out of sync, um, click the recycle symbol on the left side sort of extended panel on the screen there. So decades ago, not years ago, <laughs> I set out to find a place in the world where I could observe dolphins underwater and to try to crack the code of their communication system. Now in most parts of the world, the water's pretty murky, so it's very hard to observe animals underwater. But I found a community of dolphins that live in these beautiful, clear, shallow sandbanks of the Bahamas, which are just east of Florida. And they spend their daytime resting and socializing in the safety of the shallows, but at night they go off the edge uh, and hunt in deep water. Now it's not a bad place. Uh, yes, uh, Delia. Um, <laughs> and so one of the challenges of working with animals in the wild and live, um, is, um, sea, you know, hunt. they become acclimated to you, um, video with a which is to the scientists and so and forth. So and so it's very difficult like to and most of our um, create so to um, a scientific environment to study natural behavior when, in fact, now, the social groups a, that you're studying, nice you know, your presence them among spots, them, you don't know how much it changes their behavior. And they go through pretty distinct developmental phases, so that's fun to track their behavior. And by about the age of 15, they're fully spotted black and white. 
Now the mother you see here is Muggsy. She's 35 years old in this shot, but dolphins can actually live into their early 50s. And like all the dolphins in our community, we um, photographed a Muggsy and tracked... So one of the things uh, she mentions and here spot uh, as she matured over about the dolphin lifestyle, um, I think highlights an important, important feature of studying intelligent animals in the wild. What you're looking for are animals that have big brains, and the males mature that are social, and that are long-lived, um, so which chimpanzees and dolphins and uh, probably and birds are all like that. Um, and having long lives, like a long childhood, a long adolescence, you know, suggests that um, these animals require a lot of cultural learning before they become mature adults. They have good vision, so they use body postures to communicate. They have taste, not smell. And they have touch. And sound can actually be felt in the water because the acoustic impedance of tissue and water is about the same. So dolphins can buzz and tickle each other at a distance. And now we do know some things about how sounds are used with certain behaviors. Now, the so, and dolphins give each other names with their dolphins. calls. And it's, it's like a name. And uh, this is the best studied sound because it's easy to measure, really. And you'd find this whistle when mothers and calves are reuniting, for example. Another well-studied sound are echolocation clicks. This is the dolphin's sonar. And they use these clicks to hunt and feed. But they can also tightly pack these clicks together into buzzes and use them socially. For example, males will stimulate uh, a female during a courtship. The uh, dolphin's sonar is so effective now, that they can buzz, buzz each other remotely from a distance Don't tell because, me a you know, the uh, pressure waves that. travel through the water so effectively that they don't even have to be touching. So dolphins are also political animals, and um, so they have to resolve conflicts. And they use these burst pulse sounds as well as their head-to-head -head behaviors when they're fighting. And these are very unstudied sounds because they're hard to measure. Now, this is some video of a uh, typical dolphin fight. So you're going to see two groups. And you're going to see the head-to-head -head posturing, some open mouths, lots of squawking. There's a bubble. And basically, one of these groups will kind of back off, and everything will resolve fine. And it doesn't really escalate into violence uh, too much. Now, in the Bahamas, we also have resonant bottlenose that interact socially with the spotted dolphins. For example, they babysit each other's calves. The males have dominance displays they use when they're chasing each other's females. And the two species actually form temporary alliances when they're chasing sharks away. And one of the mechanisms they use to communicate uh, their coordination is synchrony. They synchronize their sounds and their body postures to look bigger and sound stronger. Now, these are bottlenose dolphins. And you'll see them starting to uh, synchronize their behavior. This their synchronizing is pretty remarkable, but there's kind of one dolphin there in the middle that it seems very wiggly. Doesn't quite seem to get the, the whole synchronizing idea. <laughs> I wish I was that coordinator. I think there's another um, aspect I'd like to bring in here. Now, sure. it's important to remember that yeah. you're only hearing there the human all, audible There are also of examples of sounds, and we use special related, in the water but to different these sounds. species. Now, researchers have uh, actually measured whistle people, complexity using information um, other and whistles rate very high relative to social human groups, languages. Like, uh, but burst pulse sounds are a and narwhal. Uh, yes, that's true. And in fact, she mentioned that in this video that spotted dolphins and bottlenose dolphins often cooperate by babysitting each other and mutually defending each other and things like that. So that is that that is very true. Um, and also, I think what she's talking about here is analyzing uh, dolphin um, sounds outside the range of human hearing. And since we can't hear those sounds, we use information theory to analyze what might be going on um, in those uh, non-audible ranges. And I think that's quite fascinating that we have kind of, you know, mathematical models that we can apply to this data to help us um, maybe not decode, but at least sort of analyze what's going on with the dolphin sounds. 
So we wanted to develop an interface like this in the Bahamas, but in a more natural setting. And one of the reasons we thought we could do this is because the dolphins were starting to show us a lot of mutual curiosity. They were spontaneous. So I also think this is super interesting that dolphins will mimic us in the water, us mimic in our play. postures and so forth. I, I didn't know the that, and mammals, that so they is, play. it was quite One remarkable to me. Games is to drag seaweed or sargassum in this case around. And they're very adept. They like to drag it on, drop it from appendage to appendage. Now in this footage, uh, the adult is Carol. She's 25 years old here, and this is her newborn, Cobalt. And he's just learning how to play this game. She's kind of teasing him. And, um, you know, I'm also kind of interested in, in this dolphin bl really play behavior, fun. because it seems like most animals sort of play with their mouths, like the mouth is the main way they interact with the world. But uh, dolphins use all different parts of their body. They use their fins and their tails and so forth, um, you know, sort of like appendages. And for some reason, that just seems uh, a little bit interesting to me. It, 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 it shows a little bit more body awareness than you might see with other animals like you probably wouldn't see a dolphin chasing its own tail like you see with dogs and cats for example i just think the dolphins have more awareness of their body than a lot of other animals do and happily exchange information and request toys from each other but we quickly found out the dolphins simply were not going to hang around the boat using a keyboard they got better things to do in the wild they might do it in captivity but in the wild so we built a portable keyboard that we could push through the water, and we uh, labeled four objects they like to play with, the scarf, rope, sargassum, and also had a bow ride, which is a fun activity for a dolphin. And that's the scarf whistle, which is also associated with the visual symbols. And these are artificially created whistles. They're outside so the dolphin's So at first they try to acclimate um, the dolphins to interact with a keyboard, I spent four years with which I think is also kind of interesting. Before. Um, and the other thing I think is interesting about this experiment is how hard it is to get these wild animals to just freaking pay attention to you, just to get them, just to get their attention and get them to focus on what's happening is very challenging. Just played the rope key and that's the request for the toy from the human. So I've got the rope, I'm diving down. And basically the thing play. is, there are actually very, very few animals on the planet that we can engage this way, you know, that sort of even notice us um, enough to really be able to interact with them so we can test them. There, really, there's just a handful of animals that we can do these kind of studies with. This is actually the first time that we tried this. I'm going to try to request this toy, the rope toy, from the dolphins using the rope sound, see if they might actually understand what that means. That's the rope whistle. Up come the dolphins and drop off the rope. <laughs> well. So this is only once. You know, we don't know for sure if they really understand the function of the whistles. Okay, so here's a second, second toy in the water. This is a scarf toy, and I'm trying to lead the dolphin over to the keyboard to show her the, the visual and the acoustic signal. Now this dolphin, we call her the scarf thief. Because over the years, she's absconded with about 12 scarves. In fact, we think she has a boutique somewhere in the Bahamas. So I'm reaching over. She's got the <laughs> scarf on her right side. And we try to not touch the um, Yeah, really Taglin. I think they do think we're cute. Uh, there were some, uh, I saw some headlines last year about MRI studies with elephants and that elephants think humans are cute, you know? <laughs> so... Because, you know, when they see humans, it lights up the part in the brain, I guess, associated with cuteness or something like that. Um, so I think that does happen. And I wanted to share this video with you, not to show you any big breakthroughs, because they haven't happened yet, but to show you the level of intention and focus yeah, that these dolphins have in the interesting system. And because of this, we really decided we needed some more sophisticated technology. Uh, 
So we joined forces dolphins with Georgia to Tech with Sad Starters a wearable computer group to build us an underwater wearable computer that we're calling Chat. But there's also one that now, I've seen instead of recently pushing a keyboard through the water, where a dolphin came up to a diver system, and, it's and rolled over only. like a dog would. So basically, the diver activates up. the sounds on a keypad on the forearm. <laughs> the sounds go off See, the dolphins have figured out that humans have hands, and that you know hands are very you know hands can be used to comfort you and to make you know and to touch you. Yeah, the, the dolphin took the map. diver's glove and gently the real power of the system in is in the mouth, real time sound recognition you brought so you it can toward the dolphin. to the dolphins quickly and accurately. And we're at prototype stage, but this is how we hope it will play out. So diver A and diver B both have... Um, one of the things, the things I kind of like about this video is that, you know, she's very conservative about, you know, the, the prospects for her research. Um, well, we you know, there there haven't been really any huge breakthroughs about communicating with dolphins. Um, and and I guess, you know, what's really interesting is just, it's just this sort of observing the process of figuring out how we can scientifically now, study these animals. How can you design go? experiments? Well, um, how can you attract the interest of these animals to pay attention to us. you? Um, you know, the, these very, very, very so threshold um, uh, problems that have to be solved just to freaking the study them, sounds, much less, you know, get any breakthrough the results. System. For example, right now we can put their own signature whistles in the computer and request to interact with a specific dolphin. Likewise, we can create uh, our own whistles, our own whistle names, and let the dolphins request specific divers to interact with. Now, it may be I think dolphins are also very problematic because they're so the playful. You know, they it's sort of hard to get them to just sit still range. and pay attention. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a species that yeah, they're probably close to our intelligence in many ways, and we might not be able to admit that right now, but they live in a quite a different environment, and you still have to bridge the gap with the sensory systems. Now imagine what it would be like to really understand the mind of another intelligent species on the planet. Thank you. Um, this is a little bit of a tangent, but um, for any of those, any of you who know the old animated cartoon show from the 90s, Dr. Katz, um, one of the comedians, um, I'm blanking on his name now, but talked about, um, you know, what it would be like to be Aquaman, where you can, like, talk to the fishes. And he says, what kind of crappy superhero pair was that? I mean, what would a fish possibly have to say? Like, hi, hi, Aquaman, hi, Aquaman, hi, fish. Seen any evil deeds going on? And then the fish says, hi, Aquaman. <laughs> it's like, fish have nothing to say. <laughs> How many of you have seen the Alfred Hitchcock film, The Birds? Yeah. Any of you get really freaked out by that? You might want to leave now. 
So uh, this is a vending machine for crows, and over the past few days, many of you have been asking me, how did you Oops, come Oops, I may have had, had my mic this? off. And it started as with uh, many so, big ideas, uh, or many ideas you so can't get rid of anyway crows. at a cocktail party. I, I kind of wanted to show a video about birds. Many ideas you can't get rid of anyway at a cocktail party. About 10 years ago, I was at a cocktail party with a friend of mine, and uh, we were sitting there, and he was complaining about the crows that he had seen that were all over his yard and making a big mess. And he was telling me that really we ought to try and eradicate these things. We've got to kill them because they're making a mess. And I said, that was stupid. You know, maybe we should just train them to do something useful. And he said, that was impossible. And I'm sure I'm in good company in finding that tremendously annoying when someone tells you it's impossible. So I spent the next 10 years reading about crows in my spare time. <laughs> And after 10 years of this, my wife eventually said, look, you know, you've got to do this thing you've been talking about and build the vending machine. So I did. But part of the reason that I found this interesting is that I, uh, I started noticing that we are very aware of all the species that are going extinct on the planet as a result of human habitation expansion. And no one seems to be paying attention to all the species that are actually living, well, uh, that are surviving. And I'm talking that. specifically about synanthropic species, which are species that have adapted <laughs> yeah. specifically for human ecology, species like rats and cockroaches and, co and crows. And uh, as I started looking at them, I was finding that they had hyper-adapted. They become extremely adept at living with us. And uh, in return, we just tried to kill them all the time. Um, so <laughs> and in doing one so, reason we I'm showing this video is we because in a few minutes here, he's going to... So an experiment a with so for a example, bird. Rats are incredibly responsive breeders. Solving a puzzle. Uh, as anyone who's tried to get rid of them um, knows. To extract really food from a tube. And so um, thought, let's build the, something that's uh, mutually beneficial. Well, and let's build something that we can quite remarkable from and find some way to make a new uh, relationship with species. What the bird the does to and extract so the food machine. from the tube. But the story of the vending machine is, is a little more interesting if you know more about crows. It turns out that crows aren't just surviving with human beings. They're actually really thriving. They're found everywhere on the planet except for the Arctic and the southern tip of South America. And in all that area, they're only rarely found breeding um, more than five kilometers. You know, it's interesting. Beings. You know, birds, so a lot of birds are around. very And not surprisingly, um, given the human adaptive, population, you know, they can, the it's a remarkable cities, how well out of those uh, birds have adapted to a, uh, an cities, urban environment, for example. Population boom with crows. They're, you know, so, the ability uh, to adapt to a human environment, I think, in itself is a display of intelligence. Because urban environments, like human urban environments, are just full of surprises. Uh, and um, I'll give you an circumstances, that. you know, that so you just bed, don't encounter in nature. Crow, They're constantly surprised by use, novelty. Uh, sticks in the wild. And to be able to adapt to the novelty. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Here's, Here's the video of the bird uh, um, solving the, the problem. researchers had a, a problem. They messed up and left just a stick of wire in there. And uh, she hadn't had the opportunity to do this before. You see, it wasn't working very well. So she adapted. Now, this is completely unprompted. She had never seen this done before. Hook. No one had shown her how it could happen, but she did it all on her own. So keep in mind that she's never seen this done. <laughs> right. So, not only did yeah. this crow find the wire, and by the way, I should mention these crows are. So that's uh, the they part naturally the use sticks um, to fish for food, <laughs> so it but she finds been, the wire, more and, more and then she uses really the side of the plastic crate in as, uh, to mold the, the wire off. into a um, hook. There's all kinds Completely of unprompted. Kinds of it's just they have. amazing. For example, in Sweden, crows will wait for fishermen to drop lines through holes in the ice, and when the fishermen move off, the crows fly down, reel up the lines, and eat the fish or the, the bait. It's pretty uh, annoying for the fishermen. Um, on an entirely different tack, at University of Washington, they, uh, a few years ago, were doing an experiment where they captured some crows on campus. Some students went out and netted some crows, uh, brought them in, and were you know, waiting yes. and measuring Yes, and the other thing is that again. the crow initially and to that tries to fish it out the with the week, straight wire. These particular students walked around you know, campus, like this crow goes, goes through a sequence and, and run around of and make, experiments. Make miserable. To fetch the food, they were significantly right? less like, entertained so when they tried the, the next easiest week. one first. Is just to fish it out with a straight wire, and after some then that break, doesn't work. Until they so finally then it modifies its experiment. Sure, came to try back another approach. Later and found crows so it's almost as if the crow so is um, being, don't piss like crows. reasoning. <laughs> Or now, it's sort of like, of I, I don't know, like has foresight? Do so with a giant in a sense. And a big mask. Um, so, you know, that in itself is quite uh, So we know uh, that these crows are really intriguing. smart, but the more I dug into this, the more I found that they actually have a, an even more significant adaptation. 
crows have become highly skilled at making a living in these new urban environments. In this Japanese city, they have devised a way of eating a food that normally they can't manage. Drop it among the traffic. The problem now is connecting the bits without getting run over. Wait for the lights to stop the traffic. Then collect your cracked nut in safety. Yeah, yeah, pretty interesting. So what's significant about this isn't that crows are using cars to crack nuts. In fact, that's, that's old hat for crows. This happened about 10 years ago in uh, a place called Sendai City at a driving school in the suburbs of Tokyo. And since that time, all the crows in the neighborhood are picking up this behavior. And now every crow within five kilometers is standing by a sidewalk waiting to collect its lunch. So they're learning from each other, and research bears this out. Um, Parents crows to seem to have own, a remarkable uh, ability to transmit peers, from enemies, uh, learned I like information time, from generation to generation. That illustrates that nicely. Um, the point being that they, they, they develop cultural that. adaptation. And as we heard yesterday, that's the Pandora's box that's getting human beings in trouble. And we're starting to see it with them. Um, they're able to, fat, to very quickly and very crows, flexibly adapt to new challenges crows, and new resources in their environment, uh, which is really useful if you live in a city. So we know that there's lots they of crows. Are, we found out actually. they're really smart, and we found out that they can teach each other. And when all this came clear to me, I realized the only obvious thing to do is build a vending they, machine. So that's what we did. This is a vending machine for crows, and it uses Skinnerian training to shape their behavior over four stages. It's pretty simple. Um, basically, what happens is that we put this out in a field or someplace where there's um, lots of crows, yeah, and we put know, and I don't think all around the base of the machine, using and crows eventually come by and eat the peanuts and get used to the machine being there. To, um, eventually, they eat up all the peanuts and then they see that there are I think a lot of it is just feed done tray, through and up and up like themselves. modeling behavior. And then they leave, and the machine spits up um, more know, coins and peanuts, and life is really dandy if you're a crow. Then you can come back any time to get yourself a peanut. I don't know. So when they get really used to that, we move on. Know, flight the patterns or whatever back. various used to the sound kinds of, of behaviors that they model um, to the uh, really younger generation. This, we go ahead and, and stymie them. Uh, I suspect the third it's done more like through mechanisms like that. Like most of us who've gotten like used to a thing, like this really explaining them off. So uh, <laughs> they do what they do in nature when they're looking for something. They sweep things out of the way with their beak. It's just done by modeling behavior. They knock the coins down the slot. And when that happens, they get a peanut. And so this goes on for some time. The crows learn that all I have to do is show up, wait for the coin to come out, put the coin in the slot, and then they get their peanut. And when they're really good and comfortable with that, we move to the final stage in which they show up and nothing happens. And this is where we see the difference between crows and other animals. Squirrels, for example, would show up, wait for the peanut, go away. Come back, wait for the peanut, go away. They do this maybe half a dozen times before they get bored, and then they go off and play in traffic. Crows, on the other hand, show up and they try and figure it out. They know that this machine's been messing with them through three different stages of behavior. <laughs> they figure it's got to have more to it. So they, they poke at it and peck at it and whatnot, and eventually some crow gets a bright idea that, hey, you know, there's lots of coins lying around um, from the first Kind of one of the things that interests me about this vending machine experiment up, is you, slot, you can just put and then we're something the that crow in the bird's environment, on just like until put it there, out how to do it, and, and they'll then there will, they will like just so naturally inspect it. what's significant about this to me isn't that we can train crows to, to pick up peanuts. Like, uh, test mind it. you, there's 216 million mess around with it. change just locked every year, but I'm not sure. You don't really have to encourage them to do it. They just sort of, Instead, you know, they just notice I, it I think we should look start a messing larger. around with it. I think that crows can be trained to do other things. For example, why not train them to pick up garbage after stadium events, or find expensive components from discarded electronics, or maybe do search and rescue? The main thing, the main point of all of this for me is that we can find mutually beneficial systems for these species. We can find ways to interact with these other species that doesn't involve exterminating them, but involves finding an equilibrium with them that's a useful balance. Thanks very much.
Um, okay, so uh, those are all of my planned videos. We still have a little bit of time left. Um, we can just kind of chit chat for a bit. Um, I could, uh, if if we go a little bit over time, I are people interested in watching a video about slime molds? Because the slime molds are actually, uh, you know, pretty freaking cool. Well, all right. Well, let's see if slime molds are cool. <laughs> Let's see. I hope I hope I select the right the right video here. This is not too long. It's only about ten minutes, so we'll only go a little bit over time. We know you don't need one big brain to act smart. Take ants, for example. They build intricate colonies, they farm, they wage war. Each ant has a tiny little brain. But together, um, they exhibit swarm intelligence. So this is a little bit like that means uh, the group is smart in ways that a swarm intelligence, not. you know, the Borg and so forth, resistance is futile. Tiny brain but the weird thing about slime molds is they are not a hive like intelligence. But swarm a slime mold is a single cell. A much stranger place. It's one cell with millions of nuclei. Any brain at all. It's um, a with a very, that's you know, a fascinating lot behavior. To be smart. We took a trip to the Swarm Lab at the New Jersey Institute of Technology to check it out. Studying slime mold is one of the, uh, it's probably one of the weirdest organisms. Studying slime mold is one of the, uh, it's probably one of the weirdest organisms I've worked with. My name is Simon Garnier, I'm an assistant professor at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Simon runs the Swarm Lab, which studies intelligence in places you might not expect to find it. The main research topic of the lab is trying to understand how um, what we call decentralized systems, so systems that don't have a, a boss or an architect or someone in charge, how these systems are capable of self-organizing and, and, and through this self-organization find solutions to problems. And Simon has an unlikely test subject for his studies. Slime mold is a unicellular organism, so it's a single cell, but it's a very particular cell if you compare it to uh, what people think cells are. Instead of having one nucleus, it has actually millions of them, sometimes billions of them. It's a cell that can grow over like very large sizes. I mean, one of the rare cells in the world that you can actually see with your own eyes. But as unique as slime mold is to study, it also takes a lot of patience. It doesn't move very fast, just a millimeter an hour. For someone studying animal behavior, it's one of the most frustrating things um, that you can't see their behavior directly, you have to wait. Other than that, it's cheap, uh, doesn't taste very good. I wouldn't recommend people to eat that. You tried it? I tried it. What uh, does it taste like? It's more like, have you ever like licked the floor? Like, uh, like it tastes like dirt. But slime mold isn't just weird because of its size or its taste. It also appears to be intelligent. It doesn't have a brain or a nervous system, but it can solve all kinds of complex problems without any of the so hardware. So, intelligent a behavior grows, without a brain. It can track of where it's been. It can solve mazes in search of food. It can even be trained to take risks in the name of a big payoff. And then, there are the transit experiments. About a decade ago, scientists at the Hokkaido University in Sapporo had a weird idea. What the researcher did essentially is they gave slime mold a map of the Tokyo rail system. Uh, and each of these stations was actually a food source for uh, slime mold. And then they let slime mold explore that I'm not sure what he means by said, the fact that the researchers, researchers gave a map to the slime mold? What does what that even researchers mean? researchers found a few days later was a pretty well-designed rail system that closely mimicked the real-life map. What they found is that the slime mold is actually a built network that are 
they pretty are, close to um, optimal. They are very uh, cheap to build. Amazing, but at the same time, if there is a disruption in the network, they will be able to get around it. That bit about being responsive to disruption is something that our transit networks could learn a lot from. That's um, a problem. Yeah, I think like he shows that later in the video solve. that they can uh, solve maze. This organism that's just essentially a bunch of proteins and lipids, and this thing is just capable of solving it naturally without any external help. Simon's team helped us recreate another famous transit experiment that uses a map of the United States. By placing food sources on major U.S. cities, we essentially asked the slime mold to build us an interstate highway system. Which begs the same question that so much of this asks. How is slime mold doing this? Simon's not entirely sure, but he has an idea. Here in the lab, one of the hypotheses we are exploring so is I that kind of wonder uh, the brain of the slime mold is actually the quote unquote intelligence. The membrane is how you uh, can distinguish that, that from just sort of so stimulus, the information and stimulus response the activity. Organism, so getting the inside information. Um, Meaning, you know, even without uh, a brain, uh, a single like, bit of slime um, mold can react to its uh, surroundings uh, like Vic and mentioned, like a chemical trail or the cell. Um, Simon something thinks like that. the decision making just, um, power may come from that but, ability to synchronize information. But aside from that, the fact is that stimulus we response behavior lab for um, is let it grow. remarkably and good it, at mimicking intelligence. Yes. Just the mere fact that you sort of are attracted or it's recoiled amazing. by a stimulus. Yeah, it's like moss. Yeah, um, it feels like moss. You know, yeah, it uh, me of through when, um, thousands and thousands of iterations, you, moss in our you know, starts to look so, like you're smart. And you're eating but it? I'm, no, I'm tasting um, so, instead of smelling So, it. sort of the foundations <laughs> of intelligence, I think, Before we laugh, um, we also ask the are question. seeded what exactly um, in these very, very simple well, first, sorts of stimulus response like mechanisms. Well, studying the very, very distant past. Life was unicellular at the beginning, and that's the unicellular organism. And so by looking at how something like this is capable of solving complex problems, we sort of get to the origin of intelligence. Uh, yeah, good uh, point, Sissi, about the uh, delayed that gratification. That's, aren't that's just a different matters. order from the future, like just a stimulus cars, response. It's going to be a big decentralized system. We're going to have millions of these self-driving cars on the road, and essentially they are all computers on wheels. And each of these computers on wheels is going to try to make decision in real time on which you know road to take, how to avoid this or the car, how to uh, you know find the best path. Basically, if we can tease out the algorithm that slime mold uses to make decisions, we could use some of that math for ourselves. If self-driving cars are capable of talking to each other, figuring out where traffic is clogged, they can automatically redistribute themselves in the network and, and decrease essentially the, the amount of pressure on particular road, making it better for everyone. A few days later, Simon sent us the results of the experiment. The map isn't perfect, but it is comparable to a highway network that took millions of dollars and years to create. So yes, this is just a bunch of goo in a petri dish, but it's goo that can make you question your own complexity as a human. So the question is, if slime mold is not, say, intelligence and it's using only like basic physics and chemistry to solve this problem, well then, if we are as good as a sack of proteins, like are we intelligence really or do we need to sort of redefine what intelligence means uh, when we look at something like slime mold? Hey everyone, you're watching this on the brand new Verge Science YouTube channel. The whole science team has been working on this and we're really excited. Okay, thanks everyone. I think that's all we really have time for. I'm sure we could do this all day because it's a blast. Um, <laughs> but you got to draw the line somewhere. I uh, really appreciate you all uh, attending and uh, really enjoyed the conversation today. Oh, yes, and I do want to make sure I thank Delia. She was so kind to uh, join us today to uh, uh, to provide color commentary <laughs> on uh, all the topics we discussed. Thank you, Delia. That was my pleasure. It was fun.
I think this is a topic we ought to revisit periodically. Uh, yes, I agree. Um, you know, I'm not going to become be able to come up with uh, new topics uh, for these presentations indefinitely. So I'm going to have to revisit some of them from time to time. And I think this will definitely be a, a fun one to revisit.